plastics, or more correctly, synthetic polymers, can easily be made fluid, and then they'll take up any desired shape. But they're very viscous liquids, and so a wide range of techniques have had to be developed to handle them. One of the most widely used is the process known as compression molding, a process ideal for thermosetting polymers. The polymer is placed in a mold and then compressed. The mold is heated. The polymer melts and pressure causes it to flow around the mold. As the plastic is a thermosetting polymer, cross links are then formed and the polymer sets into a rigid shape which can then be removed from the mold. In this case, the polymer comes in a fine powder which has been pressed into a slug called a preform, a process which reduces contamination. Because each preform is the same weight, an identical amount of polymer is used every time. The preform is heated to 90 degrees centigrade in a high frequency oven. This reduces the cycle time of the machine and aids the flow of the polymer in the mold. Easier flow also means less wear on the mold, which gives it a longer life. The mold is cleaned with compressed air between cycles to maintain a high quality surface finish. After preheating, the polymer is then placed in the mold. Both halves of the dye are kept at a constant temperature of 150 degrees centigrade. The mold is closed under a pressure of two tons per square inch and the polymer flows round it. The mold is kept closed while the cross-linking is taking place. This is known as the curing time. For these plates, the curing time is 90 seconds. When the polymer has been cured, the component can then be removed. Although the process is very simple, the temperature of the dye, the compression pressure, and the curing time are all critical to the success of the molding. Two or three percent more polymer than is really necessary is added to the mold to ensure that it'll be completely filled. The excess polymer is forced out as flash. While the next molding is being cured, the operator can clean the flash off earlier moldings. Compression molding can be used to produce an infinite number of different shapes and articles. More than one different color can be used during the process. These cups have a colored outer skin of melamine formaldehyde and a white inner liner of the same polymer. After the outer skin has been shaped, white preforms are placed in the mold for the inner liner. A smaller upper mold is brought down, forcing the white polymer into close contact with the outer skin. The inner liner bonds to the outer skin and the cup is complete. Very often more than one preform is needed. These can be evenly distributed around the various parts of the mold. The polymer has less distance to travel and this makes filling the mold cavity easier. This is the housing for an electric wall firm. It's made from urea formaldehyde. Cheaper than melamine formaldehyde, it has excellent electrical insulation properties. As urea formaldehyde is a thermosetting plastic, the flash can't be reused and has to be scrapped. Very large components can be made with compression molding. But the larger the molding, the more powerful the press has to be. This 500 ton compression molding machine is being used to make inspection chambers for drainage systems. The polymer used is a polyester mixed with glass fiber. This kind of mixture is called a dough, and the amount of dough has to be accurately weighed. The glass fiber strands in the dough will give the molding additional strength and rigidity. Fillers or strengtheners are often added to polymers to improve their properties. Or chalk or china clay can be added 
to reduce the amount of polymer required. In minutes, a mass of soft, formless dough is transformed into a rigid, gleaming structure. As with all compression molding with thermosetting polymers, the molding can be removed while it's still hot. The cross-linking has already taken place. Because it's irreversible, the molding will retain this shape permanently. This is why compression molding is nearly always done with thermosets. A thermoplastic would require cooling before it's removed, so a different technique is usually used. A common technique is injection molding. This component for a vacuum cleaner has been injection molded. The material is heated in one place and then injected into a relatively cool mold where it hardens. The polymer, in this case granules of ABS, a high quality polymer related to polystyrene, is fed into a hopper. From here it's allowed to fall into the heating cylinder. An Archimedean screw forces the polymer along the cylinder which is warmed progressively by electric heaters. The screw is designed so that as the polymer advances, the friction and the pressure increases. This aids the heating and helps ensure even melting or plasticizing of the polymer. The screw moves back to accommodate the polymer at the front of the cylinder, where the temperature is about 230 degrees centigrade. When the injection stage begins, the whole screw moves forward, injecting the polymer into the mold with considerable force. This particular machine produces an injection pressure of 20,000 pounds per square inch. When the polymer has cooled to about 60 degrees centigrade, the molding is ready to be removed. The polymer enters the mold through a small hole leaving a sprue when the process is complete, which has to be removed. At this stage, the molding is still pliable. Patterns are sometimes inserted to prevent distortion at critical points while the molding continues to cool to room temperature. The hot polymer is injected into the mold, which is water-cooled to reduce the cycle time. The mold temperature is very important. In this case, it's kept at about 60 degrees, which produces a fine finish and ensures that there's a smooth flow of polymer into the mold before it begins to harden. Because the process allows a high degree of control, injection molding produces a very consistent product. The equipment is expensive, though, and because the molds have to withstand very high pressure, they can only be manufactured from materials like special alloy steels, which are expensive. Very complex shapes can be made with injection molding. This is a crate for transporting bottles. The mold itself is even more intricate than the shape of the finished component, as it has a number of parts which have to move so that the molding can be released. Designing molds is a highly specialized job and one crucial to the successful operation of the molding process. With this component, the mold temperature is kept at about 10 degrees centigrade to make the cycle time as short as possible. But with too low a temperature, then either the mold doesn't fill properly or the polymer molecules fail to align in the strongest way. Weak areas can be produced, which may shorten the life of the component. The crates are manufactured from high-density polyethylene, which provides the toughness and rigidity required for this product. Plastics, like metals, can be extruded. With injection molding, there has to be a mold. With extrusion, the polymer is forced through a die to give a product of constant cross-section. In the early stages, the process is very similar to injection molding. The polymer is fed into a hopper and then into a heating cylinder. 
It's pushed along the cylinder by an Archimedean screw. In this case, there are two parallel screws, but often there's just the single screw. The depth of the screw's helix decreases as the polymer advances. This compacts the polymer and pressurizes it. The plasticized polymer is then forced under great pressure through a die with the desired shape, in this case, a pipe. The hot pipe is then cooled with water. As this is a large pipe, which is relatively thick, the component will support itself. But extruded components often have to be cooled in vacuum chambers to prevent them collapsing. Extrusion is usually a continuous process, and so as the pipe emerges, it has to be cut into suitable lengths. This pipe is made from rigid PVC, polyvinyl chloride, which has excellent weatherproof properties and good resistance to chemicals. Nowadays, most domestic waste pipes and gutters are made from PVC. Extrusion is largely an automatic process. Once the equipment is set up, and that's a highly skilled job, the process virtually runs itself. This is a modern extruder producing window sills. The extrusion is water-cooled in a vacuum chamber to prevent the cavities collapsing. This is an extruded component with a complex profile. But extrusion is a very versatile process and is also used to produce simple sheet and to coat cables. Extrusion is the start of another process used to make articles ranging from flower pots and flower pot men to large containers such as these 55 gallon drums. This process is called blow molding. A hollow tube of hot polymer is extruded. The tube is called a parison. Here, the parison is extruded slowly because the tank has fairly thick walls and is a large object. When the parison is fully extruded, the mold closes and air is blown into the parison, forcing it against the sides of the mold. The air pressure is maintained until the polymer has cooled sufficiently to maintain its shape. Blow moldings require trimming, as both the top and bottom of the parison will be caught by the edges of the mold. But all this waste can be recycled as it is a thermoplastic. A critical element in blow moldings is making sure that the wall thickness of the item is consistent with the design objectives. This cross section of the drum shows that the wall thickness is uniform throughout, even though the parison has had to stretch further to reach the side of the mold. The control of the wall thickness is achieved with a pin which moves relative to the die. As the parison is extruded, the pin moves up and down, varying the thickness. Account also has to be taken of the tendency of the parison to stretch under its own weight while it's being extruded. The movement of the pin is usually controlled through an analog computer. The layout on the board shows the variations in the wall thickness of the parison. The air is blown into the parison through these nozzles. Air can also be injected at the top through the pin or through the side of the mold. The polymer used for the drum is high-density polyethylene, one of the more rigid forms of polyethylene. This is white, and blue pigment is mixed with it to give the drum its color. A surprisingly small amounts of pigment are required to produce a rich and deep blue color.
Large objects, like this drum, have quite a long cycle time. In this case, about two minutes. But small objects, such as shampoo bottles, can be turned out by the hundred every hour. Blow molding equipment and dyes are expensive, and so are only rarely suited for large scale production. For smaller production runs, there's another process rotational casting. The polymer, in this case high density polyethylene, is placed into a split mold. The upper part is then clamped onto the lower half of the mold. The mold is then rotated round two axes and enters an oven. The rotation tumbles the polymer round the walls of the mold. As the mold heats up in the oven, the polymer plasticizes. The constant rotation of the mold ensures a consistent wall thickness. Many kinds of objects can be made with this process ranging from vehicle air ducts to specialized toilet accessories. Small items like traffic bollards. Very large objects such as this 700 gallon water tank designed for the Middle East. Precisely measured amounts of polymer are required as too much will simply produce a greater wall thickness. It's possible to use relatively inexpensive molds with this process and the equipment is comparatively simple and robust. Rotational casting is particularly attractive for small numbers of large moldings. And a machine like this can carry a number of different molds all at the same time, making the process highly flexible. After the mold leaves the oven, it enters a cooling chamber where either air or water is used to cool the mold and the polymer inside. Rotational casting is ideal for hollow objects. Usually the best results are achieved with simple shapes which have a fairly uniform cross section. It's a relatively simple and cheap method of production and its adaptability is making it increasingly attractive. A very basic and widely used process is vacuum forming. A sheet of acrylic, a thermoplastic, has been heated to about 180 degrees centigrade. In this state, it hasn't melted, but is rubbery and pliable. It's placed over a bath-shaped mold and is firmly clamped. The mold is brought into close contact with the sheet and is raised to form the rim of the bath. The mold is perforated and it's through these holes that the air between the acrylic sheet and the mold is extracted, creating a vacuum. The pressure of the atmosphere above the sheet forces it onto the surface of the mold. When the molding is cool enough to maintain its shape, it's removed. These are the forms for the fascias of mini cars. A sheet of acrylonitrile butadiene styrene, ABS for short, is drawn over the forms and clamped into position. The material here is only being used to form a decorative covering for the fascia. The sheet is heated by ceramic heaters to 160 degrees centigrade. Again, the forms are pierced with holes through which the air is withdrawn to create a vacuum. Difficult and intricate shapes in the form require more holes so that the polymer will form correctly. Before evacuation, the sheet is first blown up and drawn down onto the forms by the vacuum which has then been created. Fine water sprays are used to increase the speed of cooling so that the sheet can be removed as quickly as possible. Vacuum forming, unlike the other processes we've already seen, 
is different in that the polymer has been softened to a rubbery state, but not melted. Vacuum forming can be a sophisticated but inexpensive process for making a wide range of goods from chocolate boxes to the insides of refrigerators, from small boat hulls to photographic developing dishes. The molds or forms used in the process can be made from a wide range of materials, including wood or aluminium, and can therefore be relatively inexpensive. This sheet has to be stretched initially, and this is done by blowing it up with pressurized air. This enables the sheet to spread more evenly over the form when the vacuum is applied. This is a form for a Rover car fascia. It's more complex than the Mini, and the material used is much thicker. Again, it's clamped and heated. In vacuum forming, the polymer is pushed down onto the mold by the ordinary air pressure. But with very thick materials, this is sometimes not sufficient. Vacuum forming can be adapted to shape very thick sheets of polymer. This sheet of acrylic is eight millimeters thick. You need more than atmospheric pressure to form sheets as substantial as this into complex shapes. The acrylic sheet is heated, but the temperature of the ceramic heaters has been varied across the surface of the material to optimize its flow as it takes up its new shape. The pressure chamber is lowered on top of the sheet. The mold is evacuated and the chamber on top pressurized and this technique enables thick sheets of polymer to be formed into complex shapes. Vacuum forming is a highly successful and widely used technique for manufacturing with polymer. It's been so successful that more than half the baths sold in Britain are made in this way. Components and products are increasingly being made from plastics, and there's a wide choice of manufacturing techniques which can be used. With many of these processes, the energy requirements are small compared with that of metals, and the amount of polymer used can be accurately determined with very small or negligible amounts of waste. These factors, combined with the great flexibility of design that is possible using plastics, accounts for the increasing use of synthetic polymers.